Okay, now. Okay. opportunity to welcome you to Clifton Baptist Church. Uh, wherever you are this morning, we are certainly glad that uh, you have taken the opportunity to join us in worship this morning. Uh, there's a few announcements that I want to bring to your attention this morning. Uh, we continue to, to do our services online, our safe mode schedule as I have called it. On Wednesday nights, our prayer meeting is on Facebook Live at 6 o'clock. On uh, Wednesday nights, our youth group is meeting through Zoom at 6 o'clock. And uh, if you are not set up with me to do that, uh, please let me know. I'll be glad to take care of that. And on Sunday mornings, we are uh, holding our worship services on Facebook Live at 1030 as well. Uh, we have uh, set up a means for you to give your tithes and offering online. Um, if you uh, take, a, take a look on our Facebook page, the information is there. You can do it via text or online or through an app that they have. So if you have any questions or any problems with that, please let us know as well. Uh, we want to let you know that we're praying for you. If uh, you have any certain prayer requests or any ways that we can minister to you uh, during this difficult time, we just pray that you would reach out to us and let us know, and we would do that for you in the safest way that we can. Again, uh, we appreciate you uh, coming to worship with us this morning. Well, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 96. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. All right, join me in singing this morning, Praise Him, Praise Him, number 227.
Father, to contemplate the words of that song that say, power and glory belong to you alone. Father, that is our comfort, and that is our hope, that you are a sovereign God in the midst of all that we may endure. Whatever happens over this world, we affirm that you are all-powerful, and all things will redound to your glory. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather again today, together in the name of Christ. And I pray, Father, that everything that is said and done may glorify you. May Christ be proclaimed. May the world know that you have an answer to all our problems and to the problem of sin, and that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for your goodness, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we've got two hymns back to back now. We'll go through the solid rock and the shelter in the time of storm. First and last verse. Of the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Psalm 91, 1-2. If you would please turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. 
For this is how the holy women who hope in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children. You do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. May God bless the reading of his word.
thing, N.T. Wright. He is considered an evangelical scholar. I don't really consider him that much of an evangelical, but he is considered to be. And he wrote this article in Time magazine that said, Christianity has no answers for the coronavirus. And then he added, and this is the title, it's not supposed to. And uh, when I read that, <laughs> uh, that didn't really kind of <laughs> stir me up a little bit. And I ended up writing a pretty long response and putting it on Facebook. I mean, uh, because Christianity and the Word of God does have an answer to the coronavirus. It explains everything, not specifically this virus, but it gives us all the answers we need. The Word of God answers these questions. And I'm very disturbed that Dr. Wright didn't seem to understand that, but then again, I would kind of expect Time Magazine to publish something like that. But I want us to talk today about the coronavirus and the Bible, because the Word of God has an answer to everything that happens. And uh, God has provided the answer for it, and he provided the solution for it. First of all, I want to begin where we always must begin. We begin with God. We don't begin with man. We don't get, we begin with man's circumstances. We begin with God. And what I want us to talk about right now, what I want to talk about, is the fact that God is a sovereign God. One of the things we don't need to let happen when we see bad crises happen, bad things happen, a coronavirus and such things, is to lead us to a low and unscriptural view of God. Now, what do I mean by low view of God? Well, the Bible has, from cover to cover, a very high view of God. And what does that mean? It means that God is seen as being all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present, and being the controlling factor in the world. He is the governor of the world, so to speak. That's what the Bible presents God as. That he is the sovereign God. And no circumstances that we have on the, in this world should ever lead us to think that somehow God is not quite sovereign. Now, why does that happen? Well, if difficult things happen, if people die, and we saw this in Katrina also 15 years ago, people say, well, if God is sovereign, and it goes back to the old question of good versus evil, if God is sovereign, why does he allow things to happen? If God is all-powerful, why do, does evil happen? And some people kind of want to protect God and get him off the hook and say, well, God didn't really cause that, or God really doesn't intend those things to happen, they just happen. And so it kind of, even though a Christian would never say this, it makes God a victim of circumstances. He really doesn't control anything. He's, he's there to kind of help out once everything falls apart and he'll help you, but he's not in control. And that is an unbiblical view of God. Uh, there's no reason for us to try to get God off the hook. God doesn't ask us to defend him in that way. And But I want us to see, first of all, what does the scripture say about God? And I want to go to the book of Isaiah because I really think Isaiah has such a great view of the sovereignty of God. Although the sovereignty of God is proclaimed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 through 11. I'll give you a moment to find it. Isaiah chapter 46. I'm going to read verses 8 through 11. The Word of God says, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, a man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, I will bring it to pass, I will have purpose, and I will do it. Now God here through Isaiah is telling the sinners in Israel, first of all, that he alone is God. 
and the reason he's saying he alone is God because they were having a problem with idolatry and other gods. And he says, I declare the future before it happens. I determine what happens before it does happen. And I do it infallibly. And the, the, the example he uses, he said, I'm calling a bird of prey from the east. And he's talking about Cyrus of Persia, whom he was going to bring up. Now, at this time, Cyrus is not even born yet. It's almost 200 years in the future that Cyrus will release the Jews. They're not even in exile yet. They're going to go into exile in Babylon. And then he's going to bring Cyrus up. He's going to defeat the Babylonians and release the Jews. And so about 200 years before any of this happened, God says, I'm calling this man. I am setting it up that it will happen. God didn't just foreknow that it would happen. He didn't look through the tunnel of time. Oh, that's going to happen. No, God brought it to pass for his own purposes. And really, the judgment, the bad things that happened to Israel were because of their sin. God was judging them for their sin, but it wasn't outside of his control. God controls nations in that way. God is the controller of all nations of all their fates, of all the destiny of nations is in the hands of God. Uh, it's interesting that in the case of Cyrus here, God said, I'm calling him a bird of prey, but even though he released the Jews, Cyrus was a predator. Cyrus was a conqueror. And the Jews were released from exile, but they were never free again. They never had their own free nation. So God judged them, and God does this with all nations. Uh, a, a really a good example of that was Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, which we're, we're talking about. We talk about Cyrus or the, the Persians conquering Babylon. But if you remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar, he was the king that took, the Israel, took Israel into captivity in Babylon. And he became very arrogant. And... He was arrogant over his power and his majesty and all the things that he had accomplished, and God brought him down. God drove him insane for a period of seven years to bring him down. If you can read that in the fourth chapter of Daniel. And then it said after seven years he came to his senses. And here's what Nebuchadnezzar said. Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 to 35. At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his head. Hand. This is the words of the most powerful man in the world at that time, who has now been chastened by God. He says, I know now that God is the controller. So, as I said, no matter what we may endure, what we may see in this world, we should never let, us, let it let cause us to think that somehow God is not sovereign, or God is not in control, and that he's not a, a victim of circumstances. And I want us to understand why this is a comfort to the believer. The, the resting in God's sovereign control is a comfort. It does create some problems. Of course, you say, well, why does evil happen? Why did evil happen to me? Why did death happen in my family and all of these things? And, and in many cases, we don't all have the real answer. But here's, here's where the, the sovereign control of God gives us comfort. Do we want our lives to be at... Well, let me say this. Is it more comforting for us to think that our lives are just subject to random factors that just might happen anytime? Or to know that our lives are in control of a God who loves us and who is ordering things not only for his own glory, but for the good of his children. Now that gives us comfort. That lets us know that we have a God who is working on our behalf. Doesn't mean we understand everything. There are still many, many things we do not understand, but I find that, that God is in control to be very comforting. So when we talk about all of these things, never let it 
take you away from the biblical view of God. But I want us to see a second thing about this that does explain about why we have the coronavirus, why we have evil in the world, why we have wars, why we have uh, a situation where thousands and millions of people dying. Uh, the, the Second World War, I used to think it was 56 million died. I think I heard the other day they left it to about 70 million or something. It's, it, it was millions and millions. That's a terrible tragedy. And why do these things happen? We must understand that there's one answer to why the world is in the state it is, and that is sin. You say, whoa, whoa, you're saying that all of these things happen because somebody committed, somebody committed sin and therefore they died of the coronavirus? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Only God can answer those kind of questions. But the fact that there is sin in the world, the fact that man has rebelled against God, has created the situation in which we are in. God did not create a world with diseases. He created man, Adam and Eve, as in the beginning and a righteous state in paradise. In paradise. In the most ideal circumstance you can imagine. And there was not even sin in the world. They were not sin in their lives. They didn't have anything related to sin. And they willingly rebelled. They willingly rebelled against God. And they followed the serpent's lies. They gave in. Uh, the serpent's lie was that you will be like God. You'll know good and evil. And yes, they would experientially now know good and evil. But as in the case of all of Satan's lies, all of Satan's lies, there's a kernel truth to it, but there's a reality that he hides from you, and that is they would know it. Because they would know now good and evil because they would become evil. They would become unrighteous. And so this brought the situation into the world. And the sin of Adam, the Bible tells us, was about more than just Adam. It was about more than that. Adam was the leader of the human race. He was the first man. The Bible, in theological terms, we say he was the federal head of the human race. In other words, what happened to Adam determined the destiny of those who came after him. What Adam did would affect everyone. How do we know this? Because the Bible tells us that. Look at uh, Romans chapter 5. Now I'm going to look at verse 12. I'll give you a moment. I've been kind of whizzing through, so I'm going to slow down a minute. Romans chapter 5. I'll look at several few verses there. Very important passage, Romans chapter 5, 12 through 19. I won't look at all every verse, but that. That section is very, very important for this question and this issue. <clears throat> but Paul writes in verse 12 of chapter 5, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So Paul says that death came to the human race because of the sin of the one man Adam. Because that one man he talked about is Adam. And it spread to all because all sin. Now, when he says all sin, he's not meaning that what Romans 3.23 says, for all sin falls short of the glory of God. He is saying that in Adam, Adam's sin was our sin. In Adam, we are born in sin. We are born in rebellion. We're not born in an innocent state. Adam brought sin into the world and brought a a sin that is passed on to us. And Adam's sin becomes our sin. We're born in condemnation. David said that I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother bring me forth. That's the way we're all born. That's the situation. The Bible tells us that you and I were born in sin. That we were born by a sinful circumstance, but by our association with Adam. That's everybody in the human race. No one is accepted. So if you want to look at the culprit of why there is sin and sickness, why there is a coronavirus, why there are wars, why there is murder and all the unspeakable evils that happen in this world, it is because sin is in the world. And sin came into the world. And Adam's sin is our sin. Now, Sin brings two things. Sin brings corruption, which it did and it does, and sin brings judgment from God. 
Sin is an affront to a holy God. It is contrary to his holiness, and therefore God must judge sin. And the Bible speaks of, and Paul writes about, condemnation. He writes that Adam's sin brought us into condemnation. Now, the word condemnation speaks of having a sentence pronounced against you. Look at verse 16 of chapter 5. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So he says the judgment following that one man's trespass, Adam's trespass, brought condemnation. And it brought death. So death is not just a consequence of sin. Death is a judgment also. But even in this verse, you see the blessing of God. You know, it says... You see God's answer to man's sin. One man sinned and threw the whole world into sin and death, but God would bring another man. God would bring another man. Another man who would also represent people. But this man would be very different from Adam. This man would not fail as Adam did. In fact, Paul in, in the book of 1 Corinthians will call Christ the second Adam. The second Adam. But Paul talks about this condemnation in verse 18. He says, therefore, as one trespass out of sin led to condemnation for all men. So condemnation comes on the whole human race because of Adam's sin. But notice he said, so one act of righteousness. What is that one act of righteousness? It is Christ's righteousness. It is Christ's perfect life and Christ's sacrificial death on behalf of sinners. It leads to justification in life for all men. Jesus Christ is the one who brings life. Jesus Christ then is the answer to man's problem. He brings life because he's totally obedient. So there is a reality of judgment for sin, and we see that reality of judgment all around us. We see it in death, the fact that we all die. We see it in sickness. We see it in plagues. We see it in wars. All of these things are a consequence of sin and a judgment, a condemnation because of sin. But the message that God brings through Christ is a hope and the answer to the problem of sin, and that is in Christ. That Christ is the one who then comes and reverses what Adam did. The second Adam comes and fixes the problem of the first Adam. The first Adam was disobedient, and he represented a whole creation, and they became disobedient, and they became sinners. But the second Adam comes and is totally obedient, and he stands in for another group of people, those who are in him, those who are his people, those who trust in him. And so, therefore, his perfect obedience stands in for our sin and our lack of obedience. His perfect righteousness stands in for our lack of righteousness. His death upon the cross pays the price for our sins that we cannot pay without suffering eternally. And the answer is in Christ. So what is this overall message, biblical message, uh, for the coronavirus. What does this coronavirus tell us? Well, first of all, it demonstrates the horror of sin. The coronavirus demonstrates the horror of sin. The sin in the world has brought any kind of number of unspeakable horrors that we've talked about. And one of the latest is the coronavirus. It speaks that sin is a terrible thing. It has caused devastation in the world. It is a very real thing. That's what the biblical message, one of the biblical messages. Second thing about the coronavirus, it shows us that there is a reality of death and there is a reality of judgment. Jesus was asked in Luke 15, uh, Luke chapter 15, and this is a very important passage for dealing with circumstances of the coronavirus or Katrina or anything else. Um, I said Luke 15, so it's 13, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 13. 
There was some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but yet you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. There were two quite two situations that happened in Jerusalem. One, some Galileans from the north came down to make a sacrifice, and, and Pilate, for some reason, had his soldiers kill him in the midst of making the sacrifice. There was a second incident that happened in Siloam, the pool again, that was the southern part of the city of Jerusalem, where he fell down and killed 18 people. Now, the Jewish mind would think this way. Well, God was sure getting them. They must have done something really bad for that to happen to them. And that's the way the Jewish mind kind of worked. If, if, if you had a good life, that's because you were blessed by God. If something bad happened to you, you all obviously were under God's curse. And so Jesus doesn't answer the question as to why these things happen. It's interesting. You know, why did the, um, why did the many people die during the sacrifice? Jesus doesn't answer why did the people die that the tower fell on? Jesus doesn't answer that. Here's what he says. You better get your attention. It better let you know two things. Death is coming and judgment is coming. And unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What we need to understand from the coronavirus is that and the death that has occurred, and it's tragic. It's a tragic death that anybody dies. But it is a sign that death is going to come to us all one day. And Jesus, when he talks about except you repent, you will likewise perish, he's not just talking about a physical death. He's talking about eternal perish, eternal loss. So when we see tragedy, it should shake us out of whatever stupor we are in and cause us to realize Death is very real, and also judgment that comes after our death is very real. We will all stand before God. And Scripture says, unless we repent, we will perish. There is a reality of sin and judgment. But, but another thing that the coronavirus does and that the Scriptures do, they point us to the cross, which is the answer. The answer is not... Oh, sure, we hope there's a cure. We hope that all these things are resolved and we, we should pray for our leaders that they'll make the right decision. We should do all of those things. But it points us to the true answer, and that is the cross. The pro when this coronavirus passes on, or if they find a cure, or if they find a vaccine, that's a great thing, and we hope it happens, but other things are going to come. Other tragedies are going to come in the future. Because that's the nature of a sinful world. Is the cross of Jesus Christ. Where Christ is the solution. He is the solution now for the bright fact that we are individually sinners. And we will face judgment. And we our sins then are paid for on the cross. And we have the hope of eternal life. But Christ is also the answer for the future. Because one day he will make this world new again. Read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I don't have that time to deal with it right now. But Christ will make the world new. And so Christ is the answer. So yes, tragedy and sin is very real, and judgment's going to come. But the answer is in Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life, and his righteousness stands in for those who will trust in him. He paid for our sins upon the cross that we might not have to pay for them. And we have life. So what is the answer for the church? Well, first of all, it ought to remind us once again that this world is a very So even we who are believers in Christ get caught up in the things of this world, not necessarily bad things in this world. We just get caught up in the life of this world and not realize that this world is a temporary place. In fact, it's only a very small slice of eternity. There is a reality of eternal life. There's a reality of an eternal, uh, a 
eternal, through eternality that goes beyond this. Created as, as, as eternal beings, and we're going to live eternally. So it should shake us out of any kind of stupor about uh, this world being the place where we get our hope, and our hope is in Christ. And it should point us to that hope and not to satisfaction in this world. But one other thing it ought to do, it ought to urge us to proclaim the gospel. Because the fact that we know the truth is God's blessing to us. And there are those out there who have not known the truth, who do not know the truth, who do not believe the truth. And God has sent us out into the world and proclaim his truth. And proclaim that, yes, there is an answer to the coronavirus or any other tragedy, and that answer is Jesus Christ. And the hope that is in him. And so it should move us to do that. I'm thankful that our word gives us the answers to anything we endure. Not necessarily every answer of every situation we want to understand. But it tells us why we have these problems. It tells us what God has done to correct these problems in Christ. And then it, all, it calls us to appropriate that to believe in Christ they change our life let's pray Father we come before you we thank you that we have hope and that hope is in Jesus Christ we thank you Father that even though we are sinners even though we have fallen short of your holiness in so many ways you have showed mercy to us in Christ the perfect one the righteous one I thank you, Father, that those of us whose faith is in Christ stand righteous before you, not because of our personal righteousness, but of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that you will use these times to cause us to realize this world is a temporary place and to fix and fasten our hope upon Christ. Father, I pray that you will also stir us to proclaim your gospel to the world. And Lord, I do pray that anybody hearing this today whose faith is not in Jesus Christ, that you'll open their heart to the reality of their own sin and they will see the perfectness of Christ and come to him in repentance and in faith. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the hope you've given us in our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Well, once again, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, we would urge you to put your faith in Him. If you would like to contact us or call us, we'd be happy to talk to you. We're happy to do it by phone or Facebook or whatever, but please contact us if you would like to pray with us, if you'd like to, like to pray with you or tell you, talk to you about the gospel. May the Lord bless you. All right, please join me in singing, Save Your Life a Shepherd, read this first person. upon you and give you peace. And the Lord bless you.